Well, welcome everyone to Hope Church this morning. Welcome for those gathered here, around in different parts of the building, or watching later at home. Well, the end is sort of in sight, isn't it? Uh, in a, in a, just over a week's time, we're going to be allowed to do a little bit more, meet out in outdoor groups of six at least, and there's bigger pr- changes in prospect beyond that. But the trouble is we're not quite there yet, are we? We're still in this lockdown. People are still needing to shield. And uh, our preacher this morning, Keith Johns, is not able to join us in person. We would all prefer if he was here. But uh, think of it this way. We can, uh, in what we're doing in gathering together, we can share in the experience of the others that are having to do this all the time. They're always watching this on a screen. And also for other churches that haven't been able to meet really at all through this whole time of, uh, of lockdown. Um, you know, we can complain about our situation here. We'll think of those churches where that hasn't been possible. Think of the church in Ebbsfleet. But anyway, I am here. I'm not a hologram. Um, I am here in person, and I'm going to be leading us through the service. Uh, and so that means I'm going to begin with the usual notices. You should know what these are. We have a prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And it's a great opportunity to put into practice what we heard last week. That great message about faith, true faith in God. And it's actually been really encouraging together to see how God has answered prayer. Sometimes sometimes we can't always identify that so clearly. But other times there's some very sort of definite, tangible answers to prayer. So let's be encouraged by joining together in that. Let's use the prayer news um, it's, the whole point is that it's not just focused on ourselves, we're trying to, to um, help us to be praying for needs beyond our own. When we're feeling down, it's very easy just to get obsessed with yourself, isn't it? But let's be praying for God's work around the world. So that's prayer meeting on Wednesday. Uh, final reminder of Saved to Serve, the conference uh, next Saturday. So this really is uh, your last chance to book for that if you're aged 15 to 25. That's happening next Saturday morning. Yeah, two, if you get two minutes to come along, you get three books. Okay. So you book up and two more, you get three books. Okay. So if you get two others to book with you, you get another, you get a free book. Free book. Agreed. Great. Okay. Well, when, when we are in difficulties, when we are in trouble, what you want then is something solid, something certain, something life-giving. That's why we're going to start with something from Scripture this morning. Uh, I I don't know if this is your experience, but um, there are times in your life where nothing else is quite good enough. You know, I enjoy reading other books, I enjoy listening to other stuff, but there's sometimes when actually the thing you want is this what you can be totally certain of, of what God has revealed in his word. And uh, it's because in his word, that is where we find Christ. And this is what Paul is saying here in this extract from his letter to the church in in Colossae. Now, back in in November, uh, in the lockdown then, we were looking at some passages from Philippians. That was a letter written while Paul was in lockdown in prison, uh, in isolation. Well, this is another letter written from prison. And what struck me about these verses this week was how they remind us what we are here for. You know, what is the work of the church? Well, let's read these verses and see. We proclaim him, that is Christ, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labour struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. So what is our job as a church? Well, it's to proclaim Christ. Why? Because he is everything. If you read a bit earlier in in his letter, he tells us that Christ is the image of God. He is the creator of everything. This whole universe exists today because of Jesus Christ. He is upholding this whole universe. 
And then he goes on to tell us that how he has brought salvation through his death on the cross. Our sins can be forgiven. We can be brought near to God through what Jesus has done. He's done everything. Which means that this, the encouragement of this is that he is bigger than every difficulty. Whatever problems we may face, whatever problems sometimes people come to you with as, as a pastor, uh, the reality is I can't solve anyone's problem. I can't even solve my own problems. The point is I know someone who can, which is why my job, our role as a church, is to proclaim Christ because he is big enough for any crisis. You know, Paul here was, was writing in prison at the mercy of the Roman Empire. He was a missionary in a, in a church that was very small, that was persecuted. A church that was very insignificant. They didn't have cultural power. They were very weak. Things were difficult. But Jesus was enough. And it's also encouraging in our evangelism, isn't it? Because our job in, in, is not to promote Hope Church. You know, come and see what a great church we are. Fortunately, that isn't our message. Rather, our message is, in the sort of language of the Song of Solomon, come and meet my beloved. You know, come and meet the person that has saved us. Come and see what a great saviour we have. This is a message for everyone. So we proclaim Christ... Paul says here, we teach Christ. We are teaching everyone. And I think this reminds us there's a substance, there's a content to our message. This is not just about some sort of mystical experience. If you like, there is stuff to learn. There is ways we need to engage our minds so that our hearts are changed. We engage the whole person. So part of our what are we about? We're about seeing people change. We're seeing people brought from death to life. And we're seeing people brought uh, to become more like Christ through their union with him. I'm someone that needs to change. We all need to grow. We need this rebuke, this challenge. We need to be applying what we know to our daily lives. That how we live in the week is, is the demonstration, really, of what we think of Christ. And Paul's point is, this is actually hard work. You know, to this end, I labour. We don't grow and learn effortlessly. And in, in many ways, if the work of the church isn't exhausting at times, we're not really doing what Paul is saying here. It's hard work. But I just want to look at the next few verses, because... There's something else we need to learn. We do all this together. You see, Paul has spoken as an individual what he does. He's spoken about him and his co-workers. But this is also something for the whole church to be engaged in. Look what he says here. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Note what he says there at the beginning. These people he had not met personally. He hadn't even met them over Zoom. It was only through letters, through the reports of people that he knew. So to be physically isolated is not a new problem. It doesn't stop God's work. But what Paul wants here is for them to grow in all of this. That together we grow in Christ. That, that they would all be encouraged in heart, united in love. That is how you experience and know the riches that are in Christ. So we need to keep up contact even when we can't meet. You know, is there someone you could get in touch with this week that you haven't seen for ages in the church? Some, someone you could, you could get in touch with and maybe pray these verses for that person. Are there things that we can share of the treasure 
that we are learning of Christ at this time. The blessing of knowing him. How he has kept us. We can share these things. We have a great saviour to proclaim. So to help us do that, we're going to look at this hymn now. Um, Julia is going to play this through for us. We can can, uh, stand as as we look at this. Let me read uh, the first couple of verses. The immortal honours rest on Jesus' head. My God, my portion and my living bread. In him I live, upon him cast my care. He saves from death, destruction and despair. He is my refuge in each deep distress, the Lord my strength and glorious righteousness. Through floods and flames he leads me safely on and daily makes his sovereign goodness known. So why don't we stand and reflect on these words together as Julia uh, plays this for us. Please sit down. Let's come to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you this morning, that we can know you through your Son. We thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit that has united us to him. We thank you that we are a people who have been reconciled. We have been forgiven, we have been brought near through the death of your son on the cross. We thank you for this amazing salvation accomplished through him. And we thank you that in Jesus Christ, our saviour, we see the one who is the creator, the sustainer of this whole universe. There is no one bigger than him. We thank you that he truly is everything. He is our life, our hope, our future. And we pray, Lord, this morning that you would draw our hearts to him as we look upon him afresh. Help us to keep looking to our Saviour, that we might see him as he truly is, that he might indeed be changing us, that we might be made more like him. We pray that you would help us to trust you as he did. We thank you for how he learnt to do that in human weakness. He faced the same trials, the same 
uh, dangers, the same uh, obstacles as we do. And he trusted. We thank you that though he was tempted far more fiercely than we ever have been, he resisted temptation. We thank you that nothing stopped him from uh, fulfilling the calling that he had in fulfilling his mission of serving you. Nothing diverted him from that. He went to the cross. And we pray too that you would help us to be united in his sufferings to echo the words we find in Paul. Help us to understand that following him will not be easy. In a sense, following him means death. But may we also understand that following him is where we find true life. Pray that we would be ready, yes, to suffer for him. Because we've seen something of his beauty. We've seen the treasure that is found in him. We've seen that my every need he richly will supply. Thank you that he is enough. And may we prove that in our present circumstances. In all the different difficulties we may be facing. And and in many ways perhaps things that are different for different ones of us. We pray that in all of that Jesus would be our help. Indeed help us to have faith precisely when it is difficult. You say in your word, if you falter in times of trouble, how small is your strength? That's a challenge to us, Lord, that if what we believe doesn't help us now, what do we really believe? you've, You've revealed Christ to us precisely for such a time as this. And we pray, Lord, that we would show his sufficiency in our lives. We pray that we would persevere. We pray that we would grow, grow in our trust, grow in our faith, grow in our joy even at this time. And we pray too that we would grow together as a church. Bind us together, Lord, even when we're so separated. May you unite us, Lord, as a body. May we care for one another. May we put ourselves in each other's shoes. And we pray, Lord, that you would also even add to our number amongst us here. Build your church, we pray. And make us a witness. May we be known as a place, fundamentally, that proclaims Christ. That people would say, yeah, these are the people that make much of Christ. They keep going on about him and how wonderful he is and what a great saviour he is. And we pray, Father, that they would not just hear that and know that, but that they would experience it for themselves, that you would be saving people in this town, even amongst this congregation. So, Father, as we we bring these needs to you, we we ask you for our help. We pray too, Lord, help the church at Ebsfleet. Help them, Lord, as they are not able to meet in this way at the moment. Father, sustain them, provide for them. And we pray, prosper their witness. Do things beyond what they can imagine. Sustain the church, we pray. And we pray too for the church in Bordeaux. We pray, Lord, help them as they uh, preach this series on, on the meaning of the cross. Help them as they seek to see a new church established in that town. Encourage them, we pray. Prosper that work and build your church. For we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Okay, well, we now get our first uh, taste of uh, Keith uh, this morning. So we're going to move over to the screens now. Hello and good morning to you. Now, I want those of you who are younger than me, which is quite a lot of you, uh, to have a look at a photo that I'm going to show you. Here it is. Now I can tell you that the guinea pig is called Dusty, but who's the person next to the guinea pig? Can you guess? Well, you've had time to think, and the answer is, as you may have realised, 
well that was me I say was that was me when I was about 10 or 11 which is rather a long time ago now and I hope you'll agree with me when I say that I've changed not the same now as I was then and we all change in all kinds of different ways and sometimes we're okay with change aren't we uh, we may look forward to our next birthday because it means we're getting older and we're becoming more like more towards being an adult but sometimes change can be difficult for us so in the last year the COVID-19 virus has forced all of us young or old to make changes and this hasn't been easy it's not something perhaps that we've liked and adults have had to wear masks and that's not been easy either that's a change and then until recently schools had closed and that was a change now uh, you may have thought that schools being out was a, was a really good thing did you like that to start with was homeschooling cool for you but did you get a bit tired of it maybe after a while homeschool wasn't so cool now of course schools have gone back is that a good thing you like that or well, you're not so sure I'll, I'll leave that one with you to decide but when we have to face changes including the ones we don't like as well as the ones that we we do like let's remember that we can always trust God in and through those changes God does not change and if we're believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and we can always find out more about him from his word the Bible and we can always talk to him when we pray if we're trusting in him then whatever changes we may have to face we can find a way safely through them one of the inspired songs in the Bible we call them Psalms is about God being with those who trust him wherever they might go and the song contains these words if I go up to the heavens you are there if I make my bed in the depths you are there if I ride on the wings of the dawn if I settle on the far side of the sea even there your hand will guide me your right hand will hold me fast you see those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ those who trust in God can rely on God to be with them wherever they go and whatever the changes might be in their lives you see when we believe in Jesus Christ there's no social distancing between us and God and we can speak to God freely and that's a great thing to remember the times are still changing we're still a little bit uncertain about what's going to happen in the future but if our trust is in God and our faith is in Jesus Christ we can make our way safely through those changes knowing that God will be with us wherever we go let's take a moment to pray our Heavenly Father we thank you that wherever we go and whatever changes come our way if our trust is in you and our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ we can be sure that you will not desert us and that you will be with us in any changes that we have to face and we thank you for this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ Amen We're going to move uh, now to uh, the reading um, that Keith, uh, for Keith's message this morning, uh, Mark chapter 8, uh, verses 27 to 38, and that's on the screen here, and I'm going to read this to us now. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, 
Who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Well, Keith's going to be uh, speaking from that in a moment, but first let's um, go through this hymn together uh, now. Uh, a great little hymn that sums up beautifully who Jesus is and what he's done. There is a redeemer. Isn't that good news? Jesus, God's own son, precious lamb of God. That's, why does he call him lamb of God? It's because Jesus was this sacrifice. Uh, just as you had all the animals sacrificed in the Old Testament, Jesus was the fulfillment of that. That's why he's called the lamb of God here, the lamb of God, the Messiah, God's chosen one coming to save. The Holy One, Jesus, the Son of God. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Keith has just been saying how um, God is always with us. Well, how is he always with us? It's by his Holy Spirit. So let's again stand and um, reflect on these words as Julia plays this through. Please sit down. 
let's pray uh, before we uh, come to Keith's message. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great hope that we can have if Jesus is our Redeemer. We thank you that we can consider what Jesus has already done. He has already accomplished this. That is what gives us hope for the future. And we pray, Father, that you would speak to us now from your word. We pray that we might see Jesus clearly, see what following him involves. And we pray, Father, that this could be a day where people here begin to follow Jesus for maybe the first time, to really understand why it's the, most, the best thing they could ever do to put their trust in him, why it's the most foolish thing to do to reject him. And to do that understanding something of the cost, but knowing that it's worth it because of who Jesus is. We pray, Father, make that message very clear to us today and help us, Lord, those already on the way. May we renew our, our commitment to follow Jesus in the way that he leads us. Not always the way that we choose, but we pray that we would be people that truly are disciples, that truly follow. So, Father, speak to us by your spirit this morning. Change us, deal with us according to our need. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin with three statements about Mark chapter 8. The first is general, but the second and third are more particularly to do with that part of Mark chapter 8 that we're going to be looking at. So first of all, in more general terms, um, to become a Christian and to be a Christian, you must know who Jesus is and what he's come to do. There is more to it than that. But broadly speaking, that is what you have to do. You have to know who Jesus is and what he has come to do. Second thing that I want to say is that the Gospel of Mark can be divided up so that the first part is in fact about who Jesus is and the second part can be seen to be about what he's come to do. And the third statement is to say that if we can take those two general descriptions of two parts of Mark's Gospel, the turning point where we move from the first, who Jesus is, towards the second, what he has come to do, the turning point occurs in Mark chapter 8 at the point where we're beginning to uh, look this morning, namely uh, verse 27 onwards. Now, if we were to go back over the whole of Mark's Gospel, um, we would find that not all that much has been said about the identity of Jesus, although one or two significant things are there to be noted. So Mark begins his Gospel with what is, in some circles, an extremely controversial statement about Jesus, the beginning of the good news, or rather the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Well, now that's a controversial statement, isn't it? It gives you something about the identity of Jesus. And maybe strangely, uh, in verse 24 of chapter 1, demonic forces are seen to recognise Jesus as the Holy One of God. And again in chapter 3 and verse 12, demonic forces recognise Jesus as the Son of God. But only in chapter 8 does Jesus himself for the first time raise the question of his identity directly with his followers. He asks them who other people think that he is and then he asks them who they think that he is and as you may know Peter gives a very famous response in verse 29, you are the Christ meaning you are God's anointed one. 
And in the verses that follow, verses 29 through to 38, we find three essential pillars, if you like, three parts of the Christian message which must be kept together and without which you really don't have uh, an authentic expression of Christian faith. And we're going to think of them under these terms, the Messiah's identity, uh, the Messiah's role or mission, and the Messiah's call. So let's think about, first of all, about the identity of the Messiah. I don't want to spend too much time on this particular topic because I want to focus more on the second and the third. But the concept of the Messiah, God's special anointed servant promised from way back, is a very important feature of Jewish culture and history. If we're not Jewish, we may struggle a bit to understand this. We don't have in our history and our culture any idea that one day a specially anointed leader will arise who will lead us to wonderful victory and success and glory uh, as a nation. We might look back and say that at certain periods in history, leaders perhaps have been raised up to lead us out of trouble. Um, you might think of that, if you know anything about the history of the Second World War, in connection with Winston Churchill. doesn't mean everything he said and did was, was right, but some would look back and say that he was kind of raised up specifically to be the leader of the nation in a time of crisis. But for Jewish people, there is a long-standing promise that God had prepared and would anoint a special leader who one day would arise and bring glory to their nation and indeed to the world. Now, it's important to recognize, therefore, that the first Christians were Jewish. And this issue of the identity of the Messiah uh, was very important to them. We know that when the missionary Paul, who was of course Saul originally, when he was converted, we are specifically told that he at once began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And people were astonished because they knew that he had been a vigorous opponent of the Christian message. But we're told that he grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. You will find that in Acts chapter 9 and verse 22. And this was the crucial issue for Jewish people. Has the Messiah come? Who is he? Now, for us who maybe don't have the same Jewish background, this might not be quite so much of an issue. It may be easier for us to uh, understand and accept that Jesus is God's promised Messiah. But we must recognize that in doing that, we will have to place ourselves under the authority of the Messiah. And that will become particularly relevant as we continue. So let's move from the identity of the Messiah to the ministry of the Messiah. And in verses 31 and 32 of Mark chapter 8, we see Jesus having been rightly identified as the Messiah, explaining what it means for him to be uh, the Messiah. And this is what we are told. He began then to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside uh, and began to rebuke him. So important is this uh, description of what the Messiah would come to do that it's repeated in Mark chapter 9 and again in Mark chapter 10. And it's very easy to find because these three occasions where the ministry of the Messiah is described by the Lord Jesus himself, they're all roughly in the same place in terms of the verse divisions. So as long as you can remember the number 30, you will find these three descriptions of Jesus' ministry in Mark 8, Mark 9 and Mark 10. 
Now Jesus' revelation of his ministry, what it's going to mean for him to be the Messiah, immediately provokes a huge argument. First of all, Peter rebukes Jesus for what he's just said, and in response, Jesus rebukes Peter for what he has just said. Uh, the fact that this clash is not suppressed but reported by Mark is an indicator, one of the little indicators of the honesty of the New Testament documents. So why did Peter and Jesus react as they did? Why did Peter rebuke Jesus? Well, what is this about? Now on paper, um, the reaction may seem odd. And if it does to us, it's perhaps because we're kind of assuming that Peter would have known then what we know now about the various Old Testament promises relating to the Messiah, and he would have understood them all in their context. Uh, but Peter wasn't then where we are now. And he would undoubtedly have been influenced um, by the views in Jewish community about the Messiah around this time. And whatever people should have thought about the Messiah, the view that they had come to uh, believe might be expressed by borrowing a slogan that was used in the recent American presidential campaign by a candidate who shall remain nameless. Uh, Make America great again. You remember that slogan? Well, the uh, the slogan for Jewish people at this time regarding the Messiah would have been make Israel great again. That was their understanding of the Messiah. That's what he would do when he came. He'd make Israel great again. And many of them thought that in doing that he would crush his enemies. And some of them had no place for the Gentiles, non-Jewish people in this system. Uh, the Messiah would simply crush his enemies and then everything would be wonderful for Israel. That's probably something like what Peter thought. And so when he hears Jesus describing his mission as the Messiah in terms of suffering and dying. That's, that's not on Peter's agenda, and so uh, he won't have that. Now, you must recognise that at this point um, in Mark's Gospel, the full reason for the death of the Lord Jesus is not yet given. We get more of the reason in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, where we're told where the Lord Jesus Christ, in fact, says that the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. But Peter had heard enough. Uh, he did not want to hear any of this stuff about the Messiah suffering and dying, so he tells Jesus off. Why did Jesus rebuke Peter so strongly? He didn't say to Peter, look, Peter, you haven't quite got this right. Let me put you right here. He, he is very, very strong indeed. And the reason is this. He was being tempted and he knew it. Jesus was tempted in all points, just like we are. The Bible tells us that in Hebrews chapter 4. And in speaking to Peter, Jesus uses almost the same expression that he does when tempted directly by Satan in the wilderness, um, as reported in Matthew 4 and verse 10. Get behind me, Satan. You see, the kind of role that Peter envisaged for Jesus was, in a way, the kind of role that, that Jesus might have liked to have, because it didn't involve any suffering. It didn't involve death. It didn't involve being separated on the cross from his Father, God. There'd be none of that if... Peter's vision of the Messiah was the one that Jesus followed. That's why the Lord Jesus is so strong in his rebuttal of what Peter has to say. And we should take note of this because ever since really that day, whether intentionally or otherwise, sometimes it's been intentional, sometimes maybe it hasn't, some people, even within the Christian community, have tried to play down the role of the Messiah in terms of his suffering and death on the cross. And people have, have wanted to say that, that this is not the right way to understand the role of the Messiah. It, it's a way, but it's not the most important way. But we must remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ to Peter. 
And if we or anybody else that we know ever tries to play down or even remove references to the Messiah's suffering and death, we must see that they are, however unwittingly, doing Satan's work. They are seeking to adjust, to alter, to change the role of the Messiah. And that cannot happen. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ is so strong in his condemnation, if you like, uh, of Peter, his great friend. So the Messiah's identity, the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah. The ministry of the Messiah, which will involve him going to the cross and suffering. And now we come to the Messiah's call, the call of the Messiah. Jesus has confirmed his identity as expressed by Peter. He's explained, or at least begun to explain, what his ministry as the Messiah is going to mean. And now he invites both the crowd and his disciples to follow him in the light of who he is and what he has come to do. And the first thing that he says collides completely with much contemporary thinking today. He speaks about the need for self denial. Now, in our culture today, it is generally considered harmful to deny yourself. Surely, your feelings, your desires, your aims in life, what you want to do, who and what you want to be, should be expressed, not denied. Isn't this the way to true humanity and freedom? Now, I think those of you who are Christian believers or those of you who have been used to many Christian talks uh, and you've heard about biblical principles, um, you would expect me at this point to say something about uh, sexual behaviour. And indeed, uh, we, we have to do that. After all, the sexual revolution, which has been unfolding now for, for many years, certainly in the West, um, the sexual revolution tells us that if we, as it seems to us, fall in love with someone, it doesn't matter whether it's someone of the opposite sex or someone of the same sex. It doesn't matter whether this person is already married to somebody else or, or not. If our feelings are strong towards whoever it is and of whatever gender they might be, it's okay to go in that direction. That's what our culture tells us. And to do anything else, to suppress your feelings, to deny your feelings towards somebody else, well, that's, that's wrong. You're being less than yourself. You're not being true to yourself, we're told. Well, that's one aspect. There are many others. Am I, by the same token, allowed to continue to be rude to people, to be selfish? Can I express myself in that way? Can I express myself, if I wish to, by stealing something that might belong to somebody else? I think we, give, we can begin to see that this call to self-denial is both very challenging and includes far more than just sexual behaviour. It includes the things we say and the things we do right across the board. And there is no doubt about it. Our culture does not want to hear this. It really doesn't want to hear that we, if we're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to have to suppress, deny certain things that we might want to do or to be in order to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no way that we can make this popular or easy. And that's why some people, even within the Christian church these days, reject really the notion of self-denial. But the Lord Jesus Christ could not be clearer here. If anybody wants to follow him, then they must deny themselves. There are no options to, to, to opt out, as it were, here. And we do need to remember that. The calling is very, very clear. It is a huge challenge, but this is why we are promised the help of the Holy Spirit to all who follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is the testimony of people who follow the Lord Jesus and who do seek to deny themselves in the areas that I've mentioned and other areas that I haven't. It is their testimony that though it might be difficult, it is possible to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. 
self-denial then. The next thing that we see is that Jesus spoke about taking up the cross. Now it would become clear to the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, a bit later on exactly what he meant. At this point it might not have been clear uh, because he was speaking largely at this point to Jewish people and they understood that anything to do with, with the cross and crucifixion uh, was, was an, abhor an abhorrent thing, was a terrible thing. And anybody who was uh, crucified, exposed in that way, must be under the curse of God. So for Jesus to use this uh, picture uh, to indicate what it would mean to follow him was, was really quite, quite shocking, probably. Um, but he was, of course, speaking of the suffering that his followers would undergo, uh, the rejection that they would undergo, and sometimes even the, the physical suffering that they would have to put up with. And of course that has been true down through the centuries. From time to time his followers literally have had to give their lives to follow him. You and I may not find ourselves in that position, but these days we're certainly facing criticism, certainly in our own culture, far more uh, than we once used to, and some of the criticism is very cruel indeed. And some of you uh, who are with us this morning, um, you may have found it hard to be a Christian because you're getting criticism and aggravation from family or friends or people at work. Well, if you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, these things happen, and there's no pretending that they don't. The Lord Jesus Christ indicated that if we're going to follow him, we would have to deny ourselves and we would have to take up the cross. Again, uh, there is no option in this matter. Self-denial, taking up the cross, and then, more positively, choosing life. You see, the world around us often thinks that if a person becomes a Christian, then they're throwing their life away. So I don't know whether any of you have had people say to you, more or less, or something like, get a life. Why do you go to church? Why don't you get a life and enjoy yourself? And in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ has an answer to that. Because he points out here that people who think that they can save their lives by not following him, are actually going to lose their lives. It's the people who are willing, so to speak, to lose their life who will actually gain life. Verse 36 contains the Lord Jesus Christ's famous question, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet lose their soul? Of course the answer is it's no good at all. If you uh, achieve all that can be achieved in this life, but in the end you lose your soul. In other words, you go into a lost eternity, which the Lord Jesus himself called hell. If you go into a lost eternity, what does it matter what you gained? And uh, there's a sense in which uh, if we're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we must, as, as one person, I think quite helpfully put it, we must say to ourselves, to the person we have been, the same thing that Peter said when he denied the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you may think this is a strange kind of illustration, but uh, stay with it for a moment. The Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Peter, when he denied the Lord Jesus Christ, when others challenged him that he belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, I don't know the man. And if we're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we almost have to say to ourselves, to our behaviour, to the, to the things we have been, we have to say, I don't know the man. I don't know the woman. That is not me anymore. I, I don't know that person. Yeah, that, that was me once but I don't know that person now. And you see, eternal life is at stake here. This is no small matter. Eternal life is the issue. And if we think that we can gain life, if life will get wonderfully better 
if we give up any idea of, of Christian faith and we go and enjoy ourselves and it'll all be wonderful, the reality is that we will lose life and lose eternal life. Whereas if we are willing to deny ourselves and to take up the cross and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and to lose our life in the way that the world understands it and to say to our old life, I, I don't know you. We will actually gain life in this life as well as in the life to come. As we close, let's look at one more element here. The Lord Jesus Christ talks about the need for his followers not to be ashamed of him because if he if they're ashamed of him he will be ashamed of them on that great and final day when he comes with his holy angels now sometimes when I think we read these verses uh, and when you hear people speaking about these verses uh, we find ourselves just being challenged about the times when maybe we should have spoken up as uh, a Christian maybe in some conversation of which we were a part and we should have said something and maybe we didn't and we feel guilty about that well we do have to address those issues but if we take this in context the Lord Jesus Christ has just been talking about his mission and what it means to follow him now if you're a Christian believer this morning you understand don't you the mission at least in some respects of the Lord Jesus Christ you're glad that he went to the cross because it's your salvation there. You're grateful that when he died on the cross, he died for you. You can look in faith at Jesus dying on the cross and you can say the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Are you going to be ashamed of that? Would you rather he hadn't done it that way? No, you are so grateful. Therefore, don't be ashamed of him. There's no need to be ashamed of him. The truth that we have in the Christian message cannot be undone, cannot ultimately be contradicted because it is God's truth. May I encourage you this morning to renew your Christian faith if that's necessary to come to Christian faith if you've never come to Christian faith to hear this call of Jesus Christ and although it is a yes a tough and a hard call no question about it God will give you the grace to deny yourself to take up your cross to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and not to be ashamed of him, so that on the great day when he comes and gathers all his followers, he won't be ashamed of you. To God be the glory. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we acknowledge this morning that the words of the Lord Jesus Christ are tough and challenging. But we thank you that if we respond to these words and put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and seek to follow him, you will help us. As you call us to follow your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, you will equip us to do so. And so, Lord, we ask that you will give us all needed grace to deny ourselves in whatever areas we need to do that, to take up our cross, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and not to be ashamed of him so that on that great and final day, he won't be ashamed of us. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, as ever, uh, if anything that you have heard and seen um, in this talk raises questions in your mind, please talk to folk that you know at Hope who will be only too pleased to help you. Thank you. Well, I thought uh, to...
finish and, and respond, if you like, to that message, why don't we um, um, say this, this hymn, okay? Um, we're allowed to do that. People are allowed to recite creeds and things. So as far as I can see, we're allowed to uh, read these words together. So let's uh, do that in a quiet voice. And we can just, let's, maybe let's stand and do that. <coughs> How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes our sorrows, heals our wounds, and drives away our fear. It makes the wounded spirit whole and calms each heart oppressed. It's manna to the hungry soul and to the weary rest. Dear name, the rock on which I build, my shield and hiding place, my never failing treasury filled with boundless stores of grace. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, may we truly find the name of Jesus precious today because we've trusted him, because we have found life in him. Help us to walk with him and to obey him all our days. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Please sit down. Well, that, uh, that is uh, the end of our time. Just a reminder, uh, the Biblical Creation Trust prayer letter, um, you can pick up a copy of that on your way out. Um, and if you haven't picked up one of the uh, Beyond the Big Sea, um, you can also get one of those on the way out. I'll be saying more about that uh, next week and the plans for how we're going to distribute that round town. And finally, remember that next Sunday, uh, the clocks change, which means that if you forget that and you turn up, you'll be turning up when the service is ended. Okay? So you've got to remember to put your clocks forward next Sunday, or next Sunday night by an hour, so you get less, less long in bed.